I mean, it's part of the anarchist philosophy. If, if people are starving, you don't write a letter to your congressman. The, the idea of direct action is that if people don't have enough food, you take it. Hello, and welcome back to the New Architects. Uh, I'm Jason. Thomas is not going to be with us tonight, He, but he sends his wishes and says hello to everyone. Um, we have a great, great show for you tonight. Um, we have Chris Robey here. He's a professor from Florida Atlantic University, University, and we're going to be talking to him about his latest book called Breaking the Spell, A History of Anarchist Filmmakers filmmakers video gorillas and digital nin digital ninjas um so i want to welcome chris thank you for being here on the new architects yeah thank you so much for the invite yeah. um before we jump in i want to let the listeners know that we are giving away two copies of your book um on zombiepopcorn.com um the contest is live now so head over there and if you like what you hear enter that contest and get access to this book i actually been reading this book. I'm not com fully complete with it, but I I was drawn to it originally because of the title of Breaking the Spell. Um mm -hmm. and it, and it sparked my interest because it, it brought back memories of of the activist documentary film Breaking the Spell, right. you know, other films like Crowd Bite Wolves, the Animal Liberation the movie, the videos that sh the Shack team put out back you know, back in the early mid 90s. And so I was like, great, this is a book about about that. And so I, when I started reading it, I was kind of already had had my mind set up of what this what this book was going to tell me. Mm -hmm. And wow, was I in, in for a shock when I actually started getting the deep, deep dives about what this book was about. And I found myself just constantly going back and saying, there's such a rich history here that I didn't know, that I wasn't mm -hmm. aware of, and I didn't know the connections and stuff. So um with that i am i am really curious of what what drove you to do such a deep dive and you know what led you up to write this book and do this research mm -hmm. yeah so i did a book before this called um left to hollywood which was about radical film culture in the u.s in the 1930s and when i was talking about that book people were asking what's going on now you know this was roughly around 2010 2011 and I'm a film and media studies professor, so I kind of knew some things just through people I knew. But when I looked into the literature, like there was not really too much written. There was periodic things like about AIDS activism and animal liberation. You know, there needed to be this longer history um, that connected these things together. I have a good friend who's you know, involved in this stuff, and he made a good point. Like we tend to focus on the moments where things come into eruption, you know, very visible, like things like Occupy or the Arab Spring, but we don't study the connective links between them and sort of the infrastructures that are created prior to that. So, you know, I really wanted to do this kind of long history from the '60s to the present to uh, show the kind of the connective links and sort of the paradigms of changes going on with video activism. And um, I mean, it was a challenge of a book in that it tried to do two things at once. One, provide a pretty big history, and two, provide in-depth case studies, you know, so you could go into understanding the processes of some of these groups. So it was a challenge to do both that depth of analysis and breadth of history. So that was uh, one aspect. I'll say another one, too, that sort of came to... I kind of understood this when I started the project, but I really came to understand it much better actually after finishing it. Um, it's sort of having dialogue between different generations. You know, when I was interviewing uh, contemporary media activists or activists using media, many of them were interested in finding about this earlier history, you know, so that kind of led me on to like, oh, this seems to be the right thing. So there needed to be knowledge about these earlier kind of histories to inform their own work. But also I felt, um, or I learned that, you know, sort of the older generation needed to know what was going on now. There was also this disconnect that way from people who had been involved in movements and sort of were unaware of what's happening. So it was trying to connect those two, uh, you know, different kind of generations to get two or three different generations together to have some dialogue. And I'm excited because you know, it's predominantly written for people who are involved in it. And, um, you know, different generations of activists have been uh, purchasing the book and really giving me positive feedback so far, even though they really haven't 
read it uh, in depth, but they were just happy that it existed. You know, yeah. Somebody was trying to attempt this. In many ways, I'll just say in terms of my field, I'm in film and media studies. People like really hyper specialize in what I do, you know, so it's like they focus on this particular aspect or that. They don't really do these kind of wide, broader context. And that's why I really wanted to do a book like this, too, because even within the academy, not many people are doing this work. Some are, but but not many. Well, I think I think it's fascinating. You even highlighted at the at the kind of the beginning of the book of when you're telling the story about being on the bu bus with Occupy Wall Street and mm -hmm. the first, you, you kind of point at that like heavily. Like there's two camps with the same direction or same um, purpose, if you will, um, but not having the dialogue between the camps. And so mm -hmm. when you, when you talk about even it, it, in, just in your ac academic um, Field of study, it's there's there's two camps still within within that. Um, yeah. And so what what comes up for me is like, how do you define video activism? You know, because since it yeah. does go across <laughs> such a large range of age and just approaches, how do how do you define yeah. that? Yeah, it's it's a problematic term. So I was wrestling with that in terms of what to use, and some people obviously object to that. Um, but then again, almost any term you did. So I kind of obviously used it as a big blanket term and I kind of think of it in terms of, um, on a spectrum, you know, in terms of, I, I would say like one side of, uh, video activism is people who kind of self-defined as media activists and are often working on the aesthetics of what they're doing and trying to create a real professional or kind of quality type form. So, you know, I was, um, just up in Montreal with Frank Lopez, so I think he he fits that sort of uh, category. A lot of people who are, you know, what I refer to as video ninjas or them themselves refer themselves. And then sort of the other end of the spectrum is more much process oriented and people don't necessarily even think of themselves as media activists. They think of themselves as community organizers or whatnot and they're just trying to get people familiarized with the technology and having their voices heard and stuff like that. So a group like Media Mobilizing Project that I speak about in Philly is sort of a good example of that. Kind of a, many skill sharing groups, you know, I kind of fit into that category where it's not so much about the final product, but the process in terms of uh, legitimizing people's voices, having them articulate their issues, identify their main issues and how to uh, organize around it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So with it, I, I, I'm curious because just even in um, with the emergence of like the the videos that we're seeing now, um, like the end of the world as we know it, uh, mm -hmm. video series, um, we we hear within the activist community um, that this is just activism porn. This is not really advancing the cause or doing anything other than just glorifying a certain, you know, certain way of thinking and i know in your book um there was also talking about the black block and um mm -hmm. the strategies behind that so I'm, I'm curious to what you're thinking and what you found in all these conversations over that when people start saying this is just like porn or this is just glorifying. right yeah it's funny um you know of course like anything there's a certain legitimacy in that critique to a degree but um so the, the legitimate critique is, you know, if you kind of like just post this stuff online, right, you see it kind of on YouTube or Vimeo or wherever you might be seeing it is very decontextualized. You don't know what's going on or whatnot, you know. Um, but with that said, you know, it, it's very different of how it's used within specific groups. I guess that's one thing I emphasize in the book is that we can't just talk about these videos abstractly of just like watching them sort of out of a con with no context, no history or anything like that. So when, you know, a lot of riot porn is used, it's usually used in very kind of small enclaves, you know, where there's a particular purpose behind it. They might be mobilizing for an action or um, strategizing about something, learning about what went well, what didn't go well, or just simply kind of like rejuvenating. It's funny, I, like I said before, I was up in Montreal uh, last week for this, uh, the third anarchist film festival there. And Frank Lopez, you know, aka The Stimulator, had about, I don't know, a half hour segment or maybe even more of showing kind of the best of it's the end of the world. And just even within that context, like people really got riled up, you know, people were talking, there was a sense of 
it was they knew these struggles that they were being spoken about, right? They had kind of uh, uh, understanding. So it wasn't this abstract, just riot porn for somebody sitting in the isolation of their bedroom or their their house, but kind of a community event. And um, I'll shout out this other book that I like a lot called Bastards of Utopia, which I think is a really great title. Um, and it uh, talks about um, riot porn abroad and how it's used, a real kind of ethnographic study. Mm-hmm. So so I'm a little less, I think I used to hold that opinion much more so before I started doing the work about riot porn being kind of abstracting and not productive. But the more I went into actually the, the, you know, the cases of where it's used, it's not quite, you know, there is a purpose behind it. And usually, you know, even when the people show it, there's a discussion afterwards or before contextualizing it or whatnot. No, I, I, I agree. Thanks for adding that clarity, because I think what you point at is definitely something that your book, uh, what I've experienced, resurfaces that knowing the history is good because it, it it shows that connection. You learn from that connection so we don't re- repeat the mistakes that we have of mm-hmm. uh, getting our message out there, whether it's through media or not. Um, and, and one of the things, one of the stories that stood out for me was uh, was the importance of alternative media and um the story that was in there about the independent theater um that was handing out counter um pamphlets oh. to the michael moore film of the, yeah yeah and and the 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 commentary in the book about it was really kind of eye-opening for me it's like yeah there's there's a reason why alternative m- media in, in this vein that you're speaking to it in your book exist because even in our independent theaters or realms, it's kind of co-opted or not really with us. Like, could you speak more to that? What you what you've learned? Yeah, I mean, it's we were just having this discussion once again. I was in uh, New York, also New York City, a couple of weeks ago for this Radical Film Network conference that was pretty good. Brought in a lot of filmmakers and stuff, and we were talking about kind of the limits of mass distribution and exhibition. So. You know, one, I don't say this in the book, but I've kind of been hypothesizing it of one, just to get your stuff mass distributed, like over commercial media. I'm starting to come to the assumption that it has to sort of play into either sexist, racist, imperialist, colonialist outlook to even get to that degree. Um, so it already kind of compromises the, the video. Not that there aren't some successes that do get mass distributed. I know there are, but they're the exception rather than the rule. Um, so one is that, you know, you have to make all these compromises formally about your video that leads to problematic politics, you know, that, that are inherent in form. And then, you know, as you suggested with the book, you know, exhibition too is sort of limited, you know, in terms of it's often, you know, first of all, just screen the film, watch it and go home, which is not usually how a lot of these activist videos are employed, right? There's a much more kind of vibrant way where the the uh, film is a pretext for discussion and community organizing. That's why I start the book with uh, Third Cinema, because it kind of theorizes uh, the. there's no such thing as inherently radical media. It's only the way in which practices are used for it to do so. So, yeah, that was eye-opening to me, too, when I saw Fahrenheit 9-11, you know, in this theater. And, you know, I mean, whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly, you know, it's a critique of Bush, but it's nothing really that yeah. radical, yeah. I don't think, in terms of content, right? Um, that the, the, and this was a known theater too, I should say, for doing like independent stuff and fairly progressive, uh, type of films that they had, they felt the need to kind of hand out this, this pamphlet that sort of, um, distanced themselves from the film, which I, like I said, it was a really loop. I don't know. Like to me, it was not that controversial of a film, quite honestly. So, um, Yeah. So it, it seems like it's so vital, right, for these kind of alternative screening spaces to exist, wherever it might be, within uh, a union or a university or somebody's house or whatever, because it's really on this local level and how the media is employed to me. I mean, this is one thing I'll just say, and this was a discussion we were having once again at that Radical Film Network conference I mentioned, you know, it's somewhat a fool's errand to reach to try to reach um, the same numbers that conservative media does, because in some ways they have backing that we don't. They they play into you know all these kind of stereotypes or isms like racism, sexism, colonialism, whatever that I think inherently uh, 
media conglomerates want to distribute. So it's more important to pick, you know, smaller audiences, but the right ones, right, and organize around it. That's one thing I've learned about kind of, uh, you know, radical media, right, in terms of it's not so much the numbers, though numbers are important to a degree, but how they engage people, right? And that's sort of what the book wanted it to, to address, like the practices that define this type of media, whether it be exhibition, production, distribution. And I think I think it's great that you point out at that the difference between this and and um, kind of more mid and mainstream media that may speak about the same issues is that when it comes from the the radical media, there's there's it's not just to view it for for viewing sake or for viewing mm-hmm. numbers. It's actually to get people motivated into doing something and yeah. to speaking out against whatever it may be, or building a community, building that fabric, that network that you speak about in the book as well. Right. So, um, I think, I think, I think it's great. Um, this book has been a refresh, a refresher for me and an eye opener in so many different ways and connecting me to so many movements and um, just media, just media activists that I was not aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm really appreciative of this. And from a little, little bit of my background, um, to give source to this next question, sure. is I, I worked for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals for many of years. And part of my job is I followed Ringling Brothers around the country filming the elephants and using mm-hmm. that footage to raise awareness about it. Um, and I know that's a little different than the, the activism that you speak to in the book and what we no- traditionally think of as a guerrilla media. Um, mm-hmm. But the outcome is somewhat similar, if not the same. And so I would like to hear what your thoughts on the kind of the, the NGO m- methods versus the grassroots. And- oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious what you have to say about uh, that too. It's like, once again, this was a big, big discussion. I, it's, it's fortunate like we're doing this interview because, like I said, I was just traveling around a bunch. Um, like I said, that New York City thing, the Radical Film Network. And called. then I was in Montreal uh, for this uh, anarchist film festival and just visiting people up there. And as you know, I mean, Montreal is a very kind of vibrant uh, political community. So that constantly comes up, right? This NGOization of media making. It's, it's so complicated. So I'll just bring like at least one discussion that that we had and it's sort of implied in the book but i don't um address it too much but you know one is you're really hard pressed if you know a bunch of activist media makers like people who self-define as documentary filmmakers or whatever you know um all of them are frustrated with the ngoization of funding you know in terms of what they do in other words you know, to get the funding that they get, which is usually not even great, but like say $250,000 or something like that, which is relatively cheap for a film, there's all these strings that come attached with it, right? Uh, and, and a very kind of rote form that needs to happen, like it has to have a problem, it has to have a solution, and it has to have, a, a, you know, um, a uh, primary protagonist within it, has to have clearly find solutions and whatnot. And a lot of people, a matter of fact, almost all that I speak to who make this kind of media feel really constrained by that because they understand, right, these certain aesthetic choices have also uh, political implications with what they do, which makes it much more liberal, much more kind of uh, doesn't, isn't able to analyze systemic issues and whatever. Things like that. Of course, the crux of the problem is, and I'm sympathetic to this, is these very people need the money, right, to, to get funding. So they're not willing, many of them are not willing to go on the books to sort of critique this stuff. Some are, but it's more likely not that they won't. So there, there's that one, right, that there's an irony here. And, and particularly with uh, a longer view of the book, you know, I talked about media makers from the 60s and 70s and 80s when there was fairly robust state and federal funding in the states for this type of media making. And although there's a problem when you put your eggs in the basket for that, because if the funding goes away, it destroys their organization, which happened to hundreds, you know, thousands of them. But one, it did allow for like sort of a cross fertilization and experimentation going on. So many of the media makers I spoke with, you know, from the 70s and 80s were like, yeah, there wasn't really a clear difference you know, difference between experimental media and documentary media making. There was a real kind of hybridity going on and experimentation. And obviously all this kind of got the kibosh in the 80s with the rise of Reagan, who just pulled all this funding from the arts massively. And like I said, part of the problem was these organizations overly depended upon federal and state funding. But at the same time, it really had a devastating effect in terms of the type of 
media. And of course, this is where the NGOs come in, right, to make up the difference for the state and the federal funding. So somewhat I'm sympathetic, right? Obviously, they're coming in to fit, you know, fill in a need. But the problem is, although there's now more, more funding available, and in many ways, more documentary films have been made now ever than before, they're much more narrow in focus and in content and in terms of form that frustrates like I said, almost everybody I talk to, at least the circles that I hang out with, but I've spoken to, you know, a lot of people about it. So, you know, that's one, yeah. right? That's one issue. Um, I'll just say the second one, which I do sort of indicate in the book, and this is sort of like the problem with defining yourself as a 501c3, you know, with that kind of nonprofit status that you get, that there's a lot of inherent hierarchies in that, right? And you'll hear, like later on in the book, I sort of chronicle this, but it's fairly well known with various uh, groups, but I, I focus on free speech TV when it kind of went through this controversy of firing a bunch of workers who were wanted to unionize back in the early 2000s. Um, uh, when, when a bunch of people wanted to unionize during the, the mid 2000s, was, you know, the sense of hierarchy going on that they have to kind of inscribe within their system to get these kind of funding, to get the status that they do itself. So it distances people from the base. And you'll have a consistent critique with this throughout various organizations, you know, not to highlight free speech TV, at least at the time, but many of them, there's a tension between, you know, people who get involved in these NGOs or nonprofits and want to do very grassroots work, but they feel the structure is set up very hierarchically and, um, and inequitably, right? In other words, the people who control the stuff get more money, you know, they're being compensated more. It provides more burnout for people kind of the entry level. So a lot of people I spoke to had sort of ambivalent relationships of the, the things that they worked for, where they were like first, you know, very happy that they learned the skills that they did at the place, but also felt kind of exploited. So, you know, these are at least two things that I feel like the NGOization leads to. I'm curious what, what your experience is. I mean, everything you said is pretty much on the mark. I mean, the the experience that I have is that, yeah, I, I'm 100% grateful for the skills that I've learned within there. But the, the, the not people first mentality of, of any organization, of any, whether it's NGO or not, um, is is disheartening because it sets up the the the, the structure of that you're you're expendable, you're replaceable. Uh, mm -hmm. There, if if you're not going to do this, there's ten other people who will. Um, and so there's not the investment of the people, and there's not um, the willingness to to also from from the higher ups to move away from chasing after the dollar and actually building networks and grassroots and alliances with right. with the people that you were speaking of the people who are in the trenches doing the work and getting the messages out out there right. um and then i also you know it's kind of a duality i'm also sympathetic to that um you know the looking at some of the ngos they they are a driving force to push okay. a narrative and that grassroots some grassroots organizations or individuals can't. Um, I just think there, I wish there was just more overlap and communication with that. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, to me too, just with the NGO, I mean, there are some that are doing well, right? Yeah. That have their structure, but also are maintaining grassroots uh, organizing. And I should say too, I didn't mention this, but, you know, as well as a professor, I've been an organizer forever. I've been working for our faculty union. I was involved in alter globalization, you know, when that was going on. Uh, I was involved in a grad student and I was trying to get some free health care. So I've been part that led me to this project, too, is like I have my own experience of working on the ground and particularly um, a community organizer and a membership organizer. So like going office to office, talking to faculty and stuff like that. So the one thing that really turns me off with the bad model of the NGOs, too, is it becomes very um, paternalistic mm -hmm. to the people. So even when I'm sympathetic to a degree of like, you know, when they have whatever, I don't know if it's Sierra Club or something, but on our campus where they're like, you know, oh, can you sign your name and give money to this thing? And I'm like, you know, I'm like, there's so many problems involved with that, right? You know, <laughs> like one, you're not really mobilizing people. You're just asking them for money, which I know is important funding, but at the same time, it seems really a consumer-based attitude yeah. towards activism. And I kind of say that. Also, you know, I bring up the things in terms of obviously a lot of problems with NGOs is the funding that they receive, you know, like Bill and Melinda Gates, for example, right? The foundation that hides hundred millions, if not billions, I'm sure, of dollars away from the U.S. 
you know, and then give some kind of uh, chump change in terms of charity back. And forget, I mean, you know, Gates in terms of the uh, ecological destruction, right? That's dependent upon computers and the very <laughs> industry he's a part of. It's a hard pill to swallow, right? To support the groups that are taking that money from that, you know, and and sort of not really thinking through what does that mean of mm -hmm. us taking this money so he can represent us, but at the same time, it's the very industry that's problem, you know, <laughs> creating many of these environmental problems in the first place. I don't know. I think. Not that this is representative, but at least on my campus, it's usually like really young kids who are doing this who haven't really thought through entirely, yeah. you know, the model that they're a part of and sort of, I hate being that guy, but I sort of am, <laughs> you know, just like raising this with them. Like, by the way, you know, like you should really look in who the funders are and maybe the kind of work you want to do. I don't know. It's a fine line. You don't want to totally just, you know. Yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to break their, their motivation. Yeah. Either. Um, but you also right? have yeah. to point out that you're, you're just reinforcing the current system that we're trying to move yeah. away from. Yeah, I mean, it's a good entry step or they're doing something more. But like I said, it's I, I never give in, quite honestly. Yeah. I'm like, I, I tell them, if you want me to do like uh, community organizing or work like that, I'm more than happy. And the funny thing is when I say that, they don't know what to do, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> which, which should be like, you know, oh, let me get your name and your email or something. But they don't. They're just like kind of at a flummox because they haven't been trained yeah. to talk to people who like might actually get involved. Um, and that's a real problem, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, They're training. And, and, and you... And kind of start to question is like is is that intentional i mean part yeah. of part of is if if we're in this loop of the same the same way we look at problems and an attack of problems and it makes it easier for the system to set up the barriers to that problems like the free speech right. zones and all all the things that activists on the street go through um the things that we that were high, highlighted. which was you know highlighted in in occupy wall, wall street and you clearly pointed at it in your book um which I thought was was really well when you compared the the videos of where do we go from here versus yeah. Occupy um, yeah. the, hood. the Hood. So yeah. I, yeah, it's just like, are we reinforcing and supporting the system that we're trying to move away from or are we actually <laughs> doing systemic change? And so I want to invite you to talk about, you know, bring it back to your book about maybe that comparison of those two. Um, the two videos? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, let me just say something before that, too, like, because in some ways I'm very sympathetic to, like, you know, these kids working at the NGOs, I should say, because I'm in a university, <laughs> right? And it has its own set of contradictions, right? <laughs> like, so I don't want to act like I'm above any of this stuff, right? I'm, 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 we're all obviously embedded in these contradictions. And I'll say that's one thing about the book I really wanted to emphasize, like, how do we negotiate them, right? We have to have honest conversations of how we try to negotiate these, these contradictions in our daily lives and try not to, as you were saying, kind of replicate uh, a deeply kind of problematic, exploitative system. You know, not necessarily we're always doing it successfully, but yeah. at least, first of all, thinking it through, right, and being self-reflective, I think, is really important. So, you know, when I spoke to a lot of the groups who I interviewed, I, I kind of told them that straight up. Like, I'm not here to glorify you, but I'm not here to be unsympathetic either. I'm here to, like, just see what's going on and, like, offer a real uh, kind of sympathetic analysis, right? Mm -hmm. um, itself. So anyway, I just want to make it clear. I don't want to sound higher than thou, right? So I'm in my own set of contradictions of what, you know, being a professor at a university means and and trying to support these movements or at least whatever, you know. Yeah. No, I think that's but, good for the disclaimer. Um yeah. I, I thank you for that. And also for the disclaimer, I still work for an NGO. So <laughs> not the same ones that we mentioned in this conversation, yeah. but I am also still within that. <laughs> Yeah, and the thing, you know, like I said, for that is just like, as long as we're being self-reflective about it, you know what I mean, and trying to act in response, it strikes me as a good thing. My problem is often when people are operating and they're kind of not self-reflective about it or just sort of like overall just bolstering it, you know, mm -hmm. um, right? I don't know. I, I always get kind of uncomfortable with any kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I understand strategically why we celebrate our, we should celebrate ourselves, obviously, mm -hmm. and, and the work that we do and then the, the groups, but it's, there has to be moments of self-reflection, too, in yeah. terms of what we're doing and whatnot. But yeah, so the Occupy thing, um, God, I'm still wrapping my head around Occupy. Are you? Are they, like, <laughs> <laughs> I really am. Um, you know, it's funny. I started the book in like 2008, 2009. So it was a pretty low point, right? If you remember, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, you know, activism in the U.S. at least, and particularly media activism. People were kind of just self-reflecting about Seattle in 2009. Remember, yeah, like, was yeah. this worth anything? You know, was the global yeah. globalization <laughs> movement even worth anything? Which, of course, I think it was, but 
but it was really down, right? The times at that moment, um, you know, we had Bush, we had like Deepwater Horizon, just all these awful things occurring. Um, and it seemed like, although there were pockets of resistance occurring, it didn't seem. And then all of a sudden, you know, we have this amazing moment of like the Arab Spring and then the summer in like Spain and then Occupy, yeah. right? I mean, it was just so crazy to me that this stuff just started uh, erupting. It's really. And I knew a bunch of people in Occupy Wall Street. And I should say, I, I traveled around the US, you know, for other things, but wherever I went, I went to the Occupies, wherever it might have been, right? Just to get a sense yeah. of what was going on. Though I missed Oakland. I wish I went there. <laughs> well, you can still come to Oakland. They still meet. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, it's funny. I went to all the other ones. I will. Actually, I, I intend on coming out in October so to talk about the book. So that'll be great if I can uh, do that. Because I've been at the San Francisco one. I was in this sort of Berkeley one that was like really just waning. But so, you know, Occupy, I'm still trying to wrap my head around somewhat because, you know, first of all, just Occupy Wall Street. What was that? And then, you know, the sort of movement across the states and the globe, you know, mm. it is fairly complicated. And I just read, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this book, Paulo Garabato's new book, The Mask and the Flag. Mm -mm. Have you heard that? I have it just came out. Yeah. And I just kind of devoured it. And he was trying to make sense of like, what's the differences between the movements now of the squares, as he calls them, as opposed to the alter globalization movement. And I don't know if I'm totally convinced of what he says, but I think it's a good way of framing it. But I don't know, you know, Occupy... Well, I'll just throw out a couple of things I've observed, you know, and, and this is talking with people uh, with it. You know, a lot of people obviously were newly engaged, mm -hmm. right, in Occupy. A whole kind of new generation kind of got uh, engaged, particularly Occupy Wall Street. And as we typically tend to do, you know, when new generations, they were distanced themselves from the alter globalization movement. So there was sort of like a lack of dialogue going on to a degree, even though we had some core figures who overlap, like Dave Graber and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, my feeling was there was still wasn't a lot of dialogue going on. So hence you had a lot of the same issues coming up, um, such as, you know, trying to apply consensus-based decision-making in a mass meeting, right? Like just dysfunctionally, right? When you have like 500 to a thousand people. And I mean, this has been kind of recounted in various tales, you know, of how eventually main organizing was occurring outside of the general assemblies. And so the assemblies were more sort of just for show, you know, and not really practice of what was going on. Also, I found it really weird how Occupy never whispered the word, word anarchism, even though it was operating under many of these practices. And I never, I mean, I guess I somewhat understood it, that it has a negative connotation in the news and therefore they didn't want to publicize it. I mean, I don't know. Um... So there was that, but then there was this big kind of liberal tendency, right, in Occupy, you know what I mean? Like of not really critiquing capital in um, a, a sophisticated or systemic fashion, not really addressing racism, sexism, how all these other things intertwine with it. So you have these really weird moments of the, the, the working group by the people of color, right, critiquing Occupy multiple times and not really, you know, not really much changing, you know, and other people have brought this critique too that Occupy Wall Street was located just right by Chinatown. And really there was no kind of coalition building going on with that uh, there. So you had this like, I don't know, I mean, large, it's, there was a, some polls done about Occupy Wall Street and it's large, you know, the New York one's interesting, right? It's a largely middle class, upper middle class phenomenon. And in the city, it was largely white, right? Yeah. If you look at the numbers, it's fairly low in terms of racial diversity and whatnot. And I think a lot of that sort of manifested itself in that video as I uh, kind of analyze in the book, the uh, where do we go from here, right? I mean, in some ways, it's I, I, if you can't tell, I hate that video, right? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> to me, just awful because uh, it's so... It's so United Colors of Benetton, you know, and superficial. And I mean, on one level, it's utopian in a good sense, right, of uniting all these people together and suggesting they all have a voice. But, you know, it's very like just kumbaya type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think sort of um, refracts the sort of liberal ethos going on in Occupy, right? These were newly disenfranchised people, either college students who thought they were going to get jobs you know, and thought they were kind of set up or middle class folk who thought they had a job for, you know, much longer than they did and didn't. So they were kind of like scrambling to understand what happened to them, but there was really no great 
political analysis going on to so whatever you know a lot of, and a lot of privilege got reinscribed once again this is based off of a bunch of other readings and talking to people but you know the camp encampment in new york city at zuccotti park was sort of class inscribed in terms of who was staying where on the north or south end of the camp and things like that um so yeah then you have occupy the hood that comes out as sort of a a, a response to occupy wall street i mean let's forget about it the whole um, colonialist phrasing of Occupy, right? Yeah. <laughs> that comes up in indigenous groups. That's a whole other set of problems I don't really address in the book, but clearly we're there and just kind of shows sort of the self-enclosed way Occupy operated, right? That came up with this name and clearly was not conversant with any indigenous groups, right? That would have raised the idea of like, you know, <laughs> this might not be the best name, yeah. <laughs> right? We've been occupied, right? And that's the thing about Occupy Wall Street, too. It's it sort of, although obviously you did have participants who were involved longer in longer struggles, the, the kind of collective narrative never tied the struggle of Occupy Wall Street to longer struggles, right? So they could make these really ignorant choices of like calling themselves Occupy, and not really how, realizing how this might be offensive to indigenous folk, right? Or um, oh, sort of... <laughs> fetishizing yeah. you know consensus-based decision making but not realizing inequities that don't allow most people to participate in that mm. you know type of thing so i don't know if that gets at your thing but uh, once again i'm still trying to formulate entirely what happened I, i'll say this on this one on the other hand you know a, a lot of good did come out obviously of the occupy movement you know one bring class um austerity analysis to the forefront right there was just no discussion of that prior to occupy doing that Two, obviously, you know, just enabling a whole new set of uh, younger generation into activism. I met a lot, quite honestly, just in Montreal and in New York recently, who were saying, you know, my first, they were saying like my first time was dealing with someone who's occupied, you know, and they've gotten kind of politicized and now they're following through. And this is the other thing, you know, it kind of rejuvenated people and created new kind of networks together. So I think with Occupy, you know, I don't consider it a failure by any means because i think it created a whole new network of people that are kind of invisible right now but are definitely in conversant with one another and organizing in ways that would never have happened and it probably will come to fruition in who knows how many years yeah no i, I agree. Uh, agree and i think there's and i think there's, there's something that you're saying that like with a with the occupy it was newly engaged people and we're seeing mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing that now when with the height of standing rock and now the, yeah. the people rallying around trump i mean i've been yeah. So many rallies made it. This last May Day rally. I don't think um I've met so many people who said, This is my first March. This is my first whatever. Right. And, and it was around May Day. And I was like, Yeah, something is changing. There's something coming out. And I think the essence is is that we, you know, what your book clearly landed for me is that knowing these histories and knowing um, the stories and where they come from is going to help us build that narrative as we move forward, especially in these moments of of newly emerged people coming up and, and taking the mic. Um, there's there's a job for us, um, you know, for people who've been in been in this for a while to actually point at those things that kind of what you were speaking to earlier when there's somebody on your campus saying sign us and, and raise money. There's I think there's a role for us to actually bring in the <laughs> historical perspective and that inclusiveness that have, you know you need to think about the indigenous you need to think about mm -hmm. um, so yeah if it, yeah i'll just say too and there you know it's tricky because in some ways once again this was based off a discussion i had just earlier um last week you know there's a trick in that it has to work both ways mm -hmm. right in other words yeah i mean particularly being older you know and part of a bunch of different movements myself it's always easy to say, oh, you know, these younger generations isn't listening and blah, 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 you know, um, you know, typical old fart yeah. <laughs> complaints about younger people. Um, but in some ways, we have to be cognizant, too, of like the way in which we approach people who are just newly engaged, mm -hmm. right? There's a way in which we can come off really pompous yeah. or really arrogant, you know what I mean? Or not listening or not even realizing how conditions have changed. So our knowledge needs to change in response. Like there's a bad tendency of us to at times it's like just take our own models and kind of transpose them to the present mm -hmm. even though it might not totally apply i'm sure some of our stuff that we know works but some doesn't right so there really has to be genuine dialogue on both our parts um because we're both implicated like i don't blame young people getting turned off if you're coming to them and saying you know i know how to do it yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> you guys know nothing blah blah who isn't gonna 
not listen to that person, right? right? I wouldn't either. So it's a really tricky thing of both, you know, imparting your knowledge and whatever you might know, but also being respectful to what uh, younger folk know, right? About kind of conditions that we might be unaware of. Yeah, absolutely. Because they grow up without the the baggage that um, that we bring to the, the situation. Yeah. Like we have 20, 30 years of people yeah. in our face and just callousness to it. So sure. there's there's definitely a freshness that we need to make sure yeah. that we're attuned to and are supporting. So Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. Um, I, I, I definitely, it looks like we're getting close to the time. So I, I want to give a huge, I guess, endorsement of Breaking the Spell. A history of anarchist filmmakers, video, videotape gorillas, and digital digital ninjas, and that those two words, digital ninjas, have mm -hmm. been the words that make people perk up every time I've mentioned it. They're like, they hear everything else, and as soon as they say digital ninja, they're like, what is this book about? <laughs> <laughs> um, we are giving away two copies on our website, zombiepopcorn.com. Um, go in there now, and if you don't want to wait. Uh, you can get this book right now on PM Press. Um, there's links on the website, zombiepopcorn.com, if you want to just grab it now and don't want to wait for the contest. Um, I want to deeply, deeply thank you for spending time with, with me today, talking about your book, talking about your work, oh, yeah, and for writing this book. And um, I, I hopefully we can stay in conversation and know what's what's coming up from you so we can help promote and be in dialogue about yeah, and I should say, I mean, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. But two, I would love to hear back from people, you know, who read it. Um, um, any feedback's good. So particularly people who are engaged in this stuff of what I get right, what I don't get wrong, you know, what I get wrong. I'll say this about the book. Just, you know, it was my attempt to fail big, you know, <laughs> like I wanted to do an ambitious project. So rather than being narrow and succeeding kind of like narrowly, I wanted to at least, I don't think it's perfect, you know, and I think it has its limitations. And even ever since, even though it just recently came out, I can see some of them even more clearly talking to other people. So I don't want to act like it's sacrosanct or anything like that, right? It's, just, it's the beginning of a conversation. I look at it, right, to, to meet other people and hear your experiences and what you've done and learn. Right. That's the way I look at much of my work. It's there to kind of network and create a sense of community and dialogue with people who I might not have. The opportunity and already like i said i've been traveling around with it for the last like three or four weeks it's been great in terms of talking to different generations of filmmakers and activists and hearing their responses of what they're doing um and whatnot awesome and you say you're going to be in the bay area in october yeah uh-huh i think the end of october for about a week so i think well we're working on it but i think we're going to do city lights one okay. day and uh university is uh uh, San Francisco okay. one day. They're still working on it, but yeah, I'll definitely be there. All right. Well, look me up when, when you get in the yeah. area and maybe we'll, we'll do a live broadcast of one of your talks or get, oh, that'd help, be awesome. spread that word out and definitely go get some food and go connect with yeah. um, the local activities here. That'd be great. Well, excellent. Thank you again for your time. Um, again, the book is Breaking the Spell. A History of Anarchist Filmmaking, Videotape Gorillas, and Digital Ninjas. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks.